Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I want to thank Tracy Ann for that wonderful song and for and Dennis and his praise team. It was a beautiful worship service we've had so far today. Um, let's pray as we begin the sermon. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we want to thank you for another day of rest that we can come and worship you and learn more about you, Lord. We ask that you just guide our hearts. Um, you fill us with your spirit, Lord, and we thank you for being present because we know um, we're, you are here with us today, Lord. And I just thank you for all you've done in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So last week, Pastor Jason started off this series, Encountering Jesus. He shared about the woman at the well, and he shared the five different excuses that the women give, or the women gave, to kind of build up walls or to stop the encounter, kind of like the five hesitations that she had and the five excuses she gave. And so he gave a little bit of a hint to this week's topic, Nicodemus. He talked about the comparison um, between the woman at the well and Nicodemus. And so for today, we're going to be talking about Nicodemus. And Nicodemus' story happens just before the woman at the well. It happens in John chapter 3. And there are several different things we can see that John makes... um, and comparing these stories. We see that Nicodemus comes and approaches Jesus at night while the woman was sitting at the well and was approached by Jesus, or by the, yeah, approached by Jesus during the day. We see that Nicodemus was a Jew and he was a ruler of the Jewish people. He was a Pharisee as part of the Sanhedrin. And with that, he would have studied scripture and probably known it forwards and backwards. He would have had it memorized. While the woman at the well, um, she was a Samaritan woman, probably an outcast from her people, and probably didn't have much scripture knowledge at all with her. We see that the woman at the well, when she hears about this idea of water of life, she immediately asks for it, and she wants to receive it. While Nicodemus hears about being born again, but doesn't really ask to be born again for himself. And finally, we see the woman at the well, after she has this encounter, she goes and she tells everyone she knows. While Nicodemus, after this encounter, we don't really hear much about. We can assume that he kind of keeps it to himself. And so we see all these comparisons and kind of back and forth that John makes between these two stories. Um, but before we begin looking at Nicodemus, I think it's important to look at some of the context leading into the story. So John chapter 2 um, These are some of the events that happened right before Nicodemus' encounter with Jesus. We see Jesus in Jerusalem, and he is visiting the temple for Passover. And while he's there, it says in John chapter 2, verse 14, In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. We see Jesus go into the temple, the place that the ruling class Jews, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees would have been in charge of. And he flips it upside down. He he drives out all of the business that was happening there. And so immediately this would have made Jesus pop up on Nicodemus' radar, right? He would have known who this man was. And we see the ruling class of the Jews go and they... They go to Jesus and they're like, whose authority are you doing this on? Like, why are you doing this? And we see Jesus is known by Nicodemus. Further on in John chapter 2, right towards the end, we see this little phrase that John writes. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Last week, Pastor Jason talked about the I am statements in John and how at the woman at the well, we hear the first I am statement that Jesus makes. Even though many people had believed in Jesus and saw his signs, he knew they weren't ready and he didn't entrust himself to them. He knew they weren't ready, and so he waits, and he doesn't really entrust himself to anybody until we see the woman at the well. And so we see this interesting thing that John points out of a lot of people believed in Jesus. They saw his signs, but it didn't really impress Jesus. It's like if you have a lot of money or you have, you're 
a lot of power, or you're popular, people might flock to you for that money or, or that power, but they don't really flock to you for who you are. And we see the same idea with Jesus, right? The Jews, and especially Nicodemus, they see Jesus' sign, but they don't really see what it's quite pointing at, right? They don't know quite what the signs are meaning and how they can apply to their lives. The other day I was driving down South Meridian and I saw a person and he had this sign that said puppies for sale. And he was, he was waving it around. He wasn't doing anything like super fancy, like flipping it and doing all these cool tricks. But one interesting tactic that he had that really stood out to me was he would aggressively point at the drivers and tell them the signal. So he would like point and then like say like come this way. And so he'd be holding the sign like point and say like you come this way. And he was very adamant and like aggressive with his pointing and it really stood out to me. And so as I was driving by, he, he pointed at me, and, you know, I tried to look to see what his sign was pointing at. I tried to see, like, the car with the, the puppies in the back, or I tried to see if it was a shop or something, and I couldn't quite see what the sign was getting at. I just saw the sign, and this is what happened with the people here. They saw the signs of Jesus, but they didn't see what the signs were pointing at. They didn't see that he was the Messiah, that he was there to save them. They just saw the sign and nothing else. Though for me, it was probably a good thing I didn't see the puppies. I might have come home with a, a new dog, so that might have been a good thing. But we see that John builds up this encounter with Nicodemus. So we see this last sentence, for he himself knew what was in man. And he starts the next verse, John 3, 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jew. So John is kind of tying the two together. He's saying, I know what's inside of man. And then a man named Nicodemus comes. And we're building this, this context behind this story. And we see going to the next verse. This man came to Jesus by night. So we see Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night. And there's a couple different reasons this could be. Um, people like to say that he went to Jesus by night in order to not be seen by other Jews and Pharisees because he was afraid of what they might think. But one thing that we do see throughout John, is the idea of night being a spiritual darkness, carrying this negative connotation around it. We can see that though Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jew, he had the scriptures memorized, he had it all down, he himself was in spiritual darkness. We can see this idea of spiritual darkness with night uh, later on in this chapter, John 3.19. And this is the judgment the light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because the works were evil. We can see further on in John verse, chapter 11, verse 10, but if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not on him. Right? We see this idea that Nicodemus is walking in the night and stumbling. He's in spiritual darkness himself. We see it later on in John 13, verse 30, Judas, after he accepts the bread and he has the Last Supper, he goes into the night to betray Jesus. So we get this idea that John is building around this encounter with Nicodemus, a man who Jesus knows all about, a man who knows all about Scripture, but is in himself in spiritual darkness. Nicodemus starts this conversation with a compliment to Jesus, saying like, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he's giving them this compliment. But to me, it kind of reads more of a, a fellow teacher going to a fellow teacher, right? He's saying like, Rabbi, like, you're doing really good. We know God is working with you. I think of it as if I went to another pastor in another church and saying like, man, your church is growing. Like, God is really worth you. But we go back to Nicodemus doesn't see what the signs are pointing to. So he's not really seeing this as like the Messiah, going to the Messiah, saying like, you are God. He's saying like, God is working through you, but you know, you're still, he's, he was wanting to know more, but this is where the conversation, I think, feels a little jumpy to me. Because Nicodemus comes and he has this compliment that he pairs to Jesus. But we see Jesus respond in an interesting way. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And when you read this text through, it kind of feels jumpy, right? You, you have this compliment, and all of a sudden, Jesus comes out of nowhere with this, with this idea, and you're like, wait, Jesus, where, like, you're not even going to address the, the compliment you just got? Like, what's happening here? I think we've all had this 
kind of conversation in our lives where we're talking with someone about one subject and maybe they misheard you and, or maybe they had a random thought pop in their head and so they just kind of shout it out and you're like, wait, where did this come from? I know in Ernie's small group on Wednesday this last week, we were having a conversation about um, some of the new babies and then all of a sudden someone misheard something and started talking about something completely different and it was like, where did this come from? We all just kind of had to laugh. But I don't quite think this is what Jesus is doing. It's not like he misheard Nicodemus. To me, it more resembles a conversation I might have with my wife where I pretend I'm good at hiding my emotions or how I'm feeling and if I have a bad day or if I'm upset about something, I may, maybe I'll try to hide it. And I, I go to my wife and I start talking about something, something random, maybe like a TV show we had just watched or the weather, just something. And I'll go and I'll just, it doesn't matter what I say, the next thing she says is like, what's wrong? Like, what happened? Right? She knows me well enough to see when I'm upset, well enough to see when something's wrong in my life, and it doesn't matter what I try to talk about, she's going to steer the conversation there. And I think this is what Jesus is doing. We saw that John says he knew what was in man. Jesus knew what the problem was with Nicodemus, but he went beyond just asking, like, what's the problem? He's saying, like, I know your problem, and I want to give you the solution. He's starting to give Nicodemus the answer. He's saying, like, Nicodemus, you need to be born again to see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is, I think, obviously taken aback by this. Imagine if someone comes to you and kind of solves your problem right in one sentence, right off the bat. You're kind of like, wait, what are you talking about? And he says this, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb, mother's womb to be born? So he's kind of like answering ironically, maybe trying to be funny or poke fun at it. And he, he takes what Jesus said literal, which is interesting because when we look at what Jesus said, born again, again in the Greek actually has a couple different connotations or meanings behind it. One of the ways it can be taken is like the literal way we see it in a lot of our texts today of again. Or another way it can actually be translated is from above. So imagine it would read, um, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so we see this interesting thing, but Nicodemus kind of jumps to born again and what that would mean because you can't really imagine being born from above. Which he kind of just makes fun of himself in a way. Um, and we see Jesus having to explain it again. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Jesus basically is repeating what he first said, right? being born from above, and you need to be born of water and the Spirit. And I think for a lot of us here today, alarm bells are kind of going off like, oh, we know what he's talking about. He's talking about baptism. Like, we got this down. And that, that is kind of what, part of what he's talking about, right? We need to be baptized. We need to give our lives to God. And we need to receive the Holy Spirit. But we see that Nicodemus isn't quite getting this. You see, because Nicodemus' problem is not that he has a disobedience. He's not that he's doing all of these wrong things. It's that he has all of this knowledge. He has everything he's supposed to do, right? He is a Pharisee. He's keeping the law stricter than any of us here today are. He knows it forward and backwards. He's doing everything. He's not walking a certain distance on Sabbath. He's doing all of it right. But his problem is all of that knowledge is still in his head and he's not moving it to his heart. He's not applying what Jesus is saying to him He's not applying what he's read in scripture to his own life. And Jesus is saying, you need to be born of water and of spirit. This story, when we compare it to the woman of the well, it almost seems to some extent that it's easier for God to convert a bad person into a good person than it is for God to convert a good person into a new creation. We see Nicodemus is allowing this knowledge and this information that he has to kind of block and be this wall where he is not allowing it to apply to himself in his own life. And Jesus continues on, he says, Do not marvel that I said, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And this is another interesting little jump in the story for me. I read it, and I kind of, I get tempted to fall into the same trap of Nicodemus, 
I read it and I say, okay, I know what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about baptism. And I can kind of skim along. And then, and then I get to this verse and I'm like, wait, how does the wind blowing where it goes and we don't know where it is, how does that connect with baptism? How does this wing in, work together? Where is Jesus using this illustration from? And I think we're all in danger of falling into the same trap of Nicodemus, of placing our knowledge in front of everything else and thinking we know what's going on, thinking we know what's happening, but failing to be reliant on the Spirit. So we see Nicodemus is still not quite getting it. He says, how could these things be? Right? I think oftentimes we make fun of Nicodemus. We say, like, come on, Nicodemus, you're the teacher of Israel, like it says, but you don't understand these things? Like, come on, like, we imagine ourselves in Nicodemus's position, like, man, if I was having this conversation with Jesus, I would, I would be begging him to be born again. I would be begging him for the water of life. I would be doing all of these things. We imagine ourselves into these positions, and then we kind of make fun of it, but we fall into the same trap ourselves. We fall into this idea that we have all the knowledge. Our Adventist church has filled with knowledge, right? We have the Sabbath commandment. We know the Daniel and Revelation prophecies. We know Ellen White's writings. We have all of this information, but oftentimes we fail to apply it to our own lives. We have failed to see the change that that information can bring in our own lives. And so I think as we read the story of Nicodemus's encounter, we need to be asking the same questions Nicodemus is asking. How are these things possible? How can I move this information from my head to my heart? How can I be born from above, be born again? How can I experience a new heart in my life? How can I be filled? We need to be asking these same questions Nicodemus is asking rather than poking fun at him for asking these things while he is a teacher of Israel. So Jesus says, are you the teacher of Israel and that you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Jesus here makes a little switch in his language. We see in the beginning, Nicodemus approaches Jesus saying, we know that you are a, a teacher of God, like you have God with you. But Jesus responds to Nicodemus in the singular. He's saying directly to Nicodemus throughout this encounter, until we get to this verse, Jesus switches to the plural, saying, we know what we, we speak of what we know, and we bear witness to what we have seen. And I think Jesus is kind of referring back to Nicodemus as he said, we, we know that you are a, a teacher of God. And he's kind of pulling this connection of saying, like, we know, we speak of what we know. But then we get to the last line of receive our testimony. And it makes you wonder, like, who's all is in the, involved in the testimony? Right? We have our testimony, but Jesus is by himself in this, in this encounter. This is still early on in his ministry. He hasn't sent out his disciples to witness and tell what they have seen, to share their testimony yet. And so whose testimony is Jesus referring to besides his own? I think for me, the way I see it is he's referring back to the prophets, to the scripture that Nicodemus would have known, the, the way that he, had, he would have seen and read and he would have seen the prophet's testimony. And you see, because Jesus here is talking about renewal of the Spirit, being born from the Spirit. But this is not a new topic for Nicodemus. He should have read this and had memory, mem memorized verses throughout his life talking about this. We can see other testimonies such as Ezekiel's in 36, verse 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. We can see in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So you see Nicodemus, though he has these texts memorizes, though he has it down in his head, he is not receiving that new spirit within him. He is not applying it to his own life. And so this is the testimony that Nicodemus is not receiving. Jesus is saying, putting himself with these prophets, saying, we speak of what we know, we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Jesus continues on, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. 
Jesus here has kind of concluded his answer to Nicodemus' questions of how are these things possible? How am I to be born again? And he does this by comparing himself to a story in Numbers 21.9. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So we see this interesting connection with the story in Numbers where the Israelites have once again started to complain, started to doubt God and wondered if he had just brought him there to die um, in the wilderness, brought him out of Egypt, delivered them, saved them just to die in the, in the wilderness. And so they're going against God and they're complaining to Moses and they're just doubting it. And God gets fed up with it and he sends fiery serpents is what the text says. And the Israelites begin to get bit and suffer the consequences a little bit and they immediately begin to repent and they're saying, God, we messed up. We know you're right. We trust in you, Lord. But it's interesting, God doesn't solve the problem like most of us think he would, right? He sent the fiery serpents and a logical next step is they repented, so send them away, right? Take them away from my feet. But God instead says, Moses, build a bronze serpent, lift it up. And if anyone is bit, they will look to that serpent and live. John, God is saying, you know, though there are fiery serpents all at your feet, biting your ankles, look away from them and look to the cross, look to the serpent on that stick and live. Jesus here is explaining his plan for salvation. He's giving it out to Nicodemus pretty clearly. He's saying, this is how you, a sinful human flesh, is going to live. This is how you will receive the Spirit. If you look to me as the Son of Man is lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent, you will live. But we see that Nicodemus doesn't really change anything. He doesn't understand this plan of salvation that he's just been told. He's using that knowledge as a, as a barrier and a wall, and he's failing to apply it to himself. And so he goes out from this conversation, out from this encounter unchanged. We don't hear much from Nicodemus after this, so we can kind of assume that he had just kept to himself. He kept those questions, kept those, those concerns to himself. But luckily, this isn't the end of the story. We see Nicodemus kind of pop up here and there in John, and a verse or two here and there. And the final time we see him in John is in John 19, verse 38 to 39. After these things, Joseph of Amarantia, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. Nicodemus sees Jesus on the cross and finally experiences that change in his life. We see in Acts of the Apostles 104, when at last Christ had been lifted up on the cross, Nicodemus remembered the words that he had spoken to him in the night interview on the Mount of Olives. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And he saw in Jesus the world's Redeemer. It finally made sense for Nicodemus. After all of this time, several years later, of keeping to himself, he saw Jesus on the cross, and he experienced that change, that renewal of spirit. And not only that, but that action, that, that renewal of spirit caused him to bring 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. Right? Think about how much incense is today. We, we go and we buy it, and it normally comes in ounces. And Jesus is buried with 75 pounds of it, right? People will estimate that if that much was bought in today's market, it'd be like 150 dollars to $200,000. This is a huge change that happened in Nicodemus' life, and he shows the change that I've experienced in his heart. And not only that, God used that change for good. We see Nicodemus came forward in its defense, and this is talking about the church. So you see all of the disciples are lost at this point. They've, they've turned away from God. They had their master killed in front of them. They don't know if they're the night ones next, and they're, they're worried and scared. They don't know what's happening. But out of nowhere, 
Nicodemus comes forward with Joseph and he provides. And it shows that no longer cautious or questioning was Nicodemus, but he encouraged the faith of the disciples. Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, someone who had just been a part of the group who was responsible for Jesus' death, comes forward out of nowhere and encourages the faith of the disciples, Jesus' closest people. God changed his heart through him seeing on the cross and it experienced this change in attitude, this change in actions, right? Imagine you're a disciple. You've just had your master killed. You don't know what to do. You're afraid. You're worried. And out of nowhere, one of those members comes forward and shows this amazing sign of respect for your master, and he shows that he is following and listening to him. You would think, like, where did that come from? What is happening? When we experience God in our lives, when we allow that renewal to take place in our heart, the same will be true for us. And just like Jesus said, the wind blows, but you do not know where it goes, so too is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see, the disciples saw the wind's effect, saw Nicodemus' actions, They didn't know where it was coming from, but it didn't matter because Nicodemus was there to encourage them. And we know that it was through the Spirit changing his life. But see, just like we read read ourselves into the Bible and we see ourselves in Nicodemus' feet a lot, or maybe we're in one of the disciples' positions and we think, oh, we we wouldn't have run away from you, God. Oftentimes, we can almost feel jealous of them. Like, we have to look at a symbol. We don't get to see the real deal. Like, It's a lot harder for us almost, or we we get kind of victimizing ourselves of like, oh man, if only I could have been there during that time, like I would have been so devout, I would have been the best Christian ever. We can really just be like, oh, if only, if only. But Jesus actually says an interesting thing. John 16, verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go away... I will send them to you. So we see that Jesus, in his answer to Nicodemus' questions of how are these things possible, right? We see he gives him one answer with kind of two parts to it. The first one is the idea of being born again, born from water and of spirit. And we can see that we need to be baptized. We need to experience the spirit in our lives and not only baptized once when we're a little bit when we're younger, older, whenever, just one time in our life, but be baptized and have the Spirit come upon us every day to be daily bathed in the Spirit. But the second part of this answer that we see is the part of Moses lifting up the bronze serpent and and those who look to it will live. You see, Jesus, like he said, was also lifted up and we need to look to him to be able to experience that change in our lives. I've often heard um, from people who grew up Adventist, and I have felt this way myself sometimes, of we almost wish we would have been converted later on in life because we feel that those who have been converted later on have this, this difference about them, this uh, gusto, right? This faith, this something about them. And so we've often wished it. And I think this story kind of points out, when we, especially when we look at it with the woman of the well, right? We can see this kind of idea portrayed again, but we see Jesus' answer to that. We see that Jesus says, it doesn't matter if you have all of this knowledge, you just need to move it from your head into your heart. And we do that by we ask the Spirit to lead us to the cross. Last time I preached, I, I, I had a challenge for the church to pray for 10 minutes a day. And so today I want to add on to that challenge. I want to add on to that challenge that each day during those minutes of prayer, during that time of prayer, that you will ask the Spirit to lead you to the cross. Because, see, it is for our advantage that God was on the cross and that he went away up to heaven. Because from that, we receive our salvation, but we also receive the Spirit. And the Spirit's role is to remind us of Jesus' teaching, to remind us and pull us closer to Jesus. And so I challenge you today that during your time in prayer that you will ask the Spirit to lead you to the cross because that will guide you to make it so your knowledge from this church, from what you hear in Sabbath school, from what you hear each Sabbath, 
It cannot just apply to your head and be like, oh, I know more about the Bible. But you can see the results. You can see the actions in your life. Throughout the gospel, we see Jesus talking about, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. If you love me, you will obey my teachings. It's not a, if you love me, you're going to do this because you should. It's, it's a natural reaction, right? This knowledge that we get each week, throughout the week, this knowledge that we get, it naturally wants to go to our heart, and the Spirit guides us there so that we can see the actions in our lives. You see, the Spirit will lead us to the cross, and it is through that that we experience a change like Nicodemus. Let's pray today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for all that you've done. Lord, we can't imagine the the pain and the suffering you went through on that cross, but we can never repay you, and so we just say thank you, Lord. We ask that you will pour out your Spirit on our lives, that you will guide us to your cross, and that we can experience the change in our lives, Lord. Lord, we desperately long for your soon coming, and we are just so thankful for all that you have done for us. In your name we pray. Amen.